Good morning. How is everyone? You ready for Labor Day? By the way, uh, I was thinking about it. Just one person. <laughs> Labor Day, why is it day off? When Labor Day, we should be laboring, working? Some, something doesn't add up. Labor Day, we should be working, but we get day off. So there's more reasons to celebrate. And um, last week, we spent uh, on vacation with my family. We had awesome time. But of course, I, of course, I missed the church. I missed all of you. But I heard good reports. So I just want to thank all of, all of the people who made the service possible, who prepared the message and the worship. So let's just give it up for all the volunteers who make every Sunday uh, just awesome, exciting. Every Sunday is an event. And this is the first, first Sunday of September. And I know that God has prepared for us so much in the future. But I want us to be people who live in the now. You know how, how sometimes we live just uh, dreaming about the future. We think, only if I got to a certain point. Only if I made so much money. Only if I got this job. Only if I got married or whatever it is. Then I would be happy. You know, every day we have things to celebrate. Every day. Every Sunday. So today, before I go into the message, I just wanted to celebrate what God has done so far. I just want you to remind that we launched our church in March. And up until now, I just see God going before us in a big way. I can tell you that 30 people have been baptized in water so far. And this is only beginning. Number of people rededicated. Number of people gave their life to Christ. Made the decision. And I am so excited. Most, most than anything, I'm excited seeing people change when they just come maybe there is a baggage maybe there is hurt maybe there is a need i'm excited to see them change I, i'm excited to walk with them throughout through their journey with god and as i was worshiping this morning you know i realized as we sang words spirit of the living god spirit of the living god i realized that jesus when he was ministering to the people, he was filled with the same spirit that we are filled this morning. Whatever Jesus did when he showed up somewhere, it could happen here this morning. Imagine Jesus is here and he's speaking to you. What is your need? What do you need this morning? What do you need this morning? Imagine the spirit of the living God is here and Jesus can minister to you. Whatever your need is, it can be answered. We just heard a couple of praise reports. But I know we all have praise reports. So I want us to celebrate God's goodness. I want us to celebrate God's love and mercy every day. So let's just give up for God one more time. And I know that today could be your day. When new things happen for you, when you realize more and more of who God is for you. In your situation, maybe you have some troubles, maybe you have difficulties in life. Spirit of the living God is here. He can touch your life. God can work in your situation. Grab hold of God today, this morning. Don't wait for anything else. Be open for Him. And you know, I'm even more excited today. Because I'm going to start a new series, and this series is going to go for several weeks, probably right before we go into services. And this series says, Build This Church. You know, I'm so excited about new series when it comes to church. And you would probably say, of course, you're the pastor, you need to be excited. No, honestly, I'm just excited when I see new church starting. And especially when it's Connect Church, when it's our church. I'm so excited to see how God is just making things happen. When I see dedicated people, when I show up here at 930 and I see things happening. People staying at their post. Coffee's brewing. Kids Zone is working. Nursery. And people just excited about God. Excited about serving others. That makes me happy. You know why? Because Jesus is excited about church. Do you know that Jesus 
it doesn't get any more excited about anything else in this world but about his church. That's why this is a place to celebrate. You know, some people, they go to church, they like the reverence, they like the quiet, but I like to celebrate. I like to celebrate because whenever Jesus showed up somewhere, there was no quiet moment there. Someone got changed, someone got healed, someone's eyes opened, someone received revelation of who Jesus is. There was no quiet moment when Jesus was there. You know when he had quiet moment? When he was one-on-one -on -one with God. That's a good time for a quiet moment. So I believe all of you should be having quiet moment in your home, in your prayer closet, or whatever you pray, in the shower, whatever you pray. But whenever we get together, it's time to celebrate what God is doing. It's time to just shout to the Lord and give him praise because he is good God. And he has good plans for your life. And he has good plans for this church. And I am so glad to be part of what God is doing at Connect Church. I'm just so glad that I can say, Lord, here I am. The way I am, you can use me. And so do you. You can say the same thing to God. God, here I am. Use me. Let's build this church together. Let's make this church happen. And before we go into services, I just want to talk about the church. I want to get you excited about church. I want to get you happy about the church because Jesus is happy when people are healed. So, I'm excited. I'm going to talk about the church. And I'm going to, like I told you before, I'm going to talk about purposes of the church. I know that most of us grew up in church somewhere or attended church somewhere. But what I find interesting that not very many people know purposes of the church besides of course coming to church giving singing praising what are the purposes of the church that's why sometimes people get disinterested in the church they leave church because they don't know what is there to do like besides just doing the obvious how can I be part of it and in recent years as we know church of Jesus has been blamed for standing in the way of the, all the cultural changes that are taking place in our society. Have you ever noticed there is a hate crime? Okay, church, church. Church is to be blamed because in the church they, they supposedly teach people to hate people that are different. So church is to blame. Now, Christians are blamed for unwillingness to adopt and accept the new world order, new world view. We have, to, we have to be just like everyone else. We are accused of being judgmental, unloving, close-minded, bigoted, and you know all those names that we've been enjoying lately and throughout the history. If anything, church is to be blamed. And we know that we live in post-Christian era, especially in Europe. You know, that's where the Christianity would, was so dominant for hundreds of of years and everything revolved around Christianity you know that it used to be that the most education person in the community was the priest was the pastor he knew how to read he was educated the biggest and prettiest building in the community was the church the biggest beautiful building was the church now how about calendar all the community events, they revolved around the calendar. Now, in your own school, you would say, it used to be Christmas break. Now, what kind of break do you get in your school? It's winter or New Year's, whatever it is. It's just holiday. You choose the holiday. Could be Hanukkah, could be anything else. It reminds me, when I, when I was in school, we didn't have Christmas holiday. We had New Year's break. So, same thing here. People, people just changed the name. And it used to be Easter break. Now it's spring break. So, everything is changing. And now, when you look around, you think, okay, there is no hope for us. Everything is changing. Everything is stacked against the Christians. And some people become just... Uh, hopeless they're like there is no hope in this world church is being just put aside no one respects the church no one respects the clergy and think about movies you saw lately how do clergy how do they portray clergy pastors and, and priests not in a very good light 
They usually croaks, they usually do it for money, or they're just perverts, they're just altogether bad. So there's not many instances when clergy portrayed in a good light, like they're sincere, they care for people. Not very much of that happening today. Now, all this picture is very bleak, right? We're thinking, okay, this is, this is it. But let me tell you the other side of the story. This is one side of the story. How about the, the other the side of the story? You know how we feel sometimes is not, not based on reality. Sometimes our feelings are not based on reality. Let me tell you this. Did you know that every third person in the world, I'm not talking America, every third person in the world is a Christian. In America, it's probably 7 out of 10 or even 8 out of 10, they would tell you they're a Christian. Do you know what it equals to in numbers? It's more than 2.2 billion people, Christians in the world. Now, let's look at it this way. Have you ever seen, has the world ever known an army of that size? There never has been an army of 2.2 or more billion people in the world. Imagine what that army can do in one year. In one year, what this army can do for Christ. On any Sunday today, as you know, the, the world, uh, the, the time differences, time changes. But on any given Sunday, pastors and priests reach the biggest audience of people than any other form of media in the world. They reach biggest audience of people than anything else in the world. Now, don't we have the greatest message don't we have the greatest message, message of hope, message for the future, message for the soul? So what is the problem then? What is the problem? Imagine if everyone, one person, 2.2 billion of Christians brought one person to church a year. One person. In three years, the whole world would be evangelized. Isn't that amazing? When we think about it, there's 2.2 billion of Christians in this world. Yet, about 2,900 people, groups, and tribes never heard the name of Jesus. 2,900 never heard the name of Jesus, and they don't have New Testament available in their language. For every church, or even new church, or established church. The goal is to find its purpose and communicate that purpose to people. Now, if our purpose, purpose of the church, was just to come, to sit, to enjoy, and then go home, then our job is done. We have done that today. I congratulate you. We have done our job. But there is so much more to the church, to church of Jesus Christ, than, than just coming to service, than just being in a service, or, or, or calling yourself a Christian. But our job became so much easier that we don't have to find out. We don't have to come up with creative ideas for the church. You know why? Because this church is not my church. This church is not your church. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, I will build my church. I will build my church. So Jesus has a mission. And whenever you serve, let me just tell you, reassure you that. That's why I'm so excited. Whenever you serve in the local church, you're helping Jesus. Literally. He says, I will build my church. Whenever you come here and you help, you're helping Jesus. You're not only helping me and the leaders team. You're helping Jesus. You're, he's next to you. He's building church. And now you're building. It's only like a father and son. Son has a little set of tools, little hammer. And Jesus has a huge one. But you're helping. You're doing the same thing as Jesus does. 
When the church attempts to invent itself instead of finding out why it was invented, time is lost, resources, and efforts are wasted. So we're not trying to invent the church. Even though we're a brand new church, we just started. I'm not trying to invent something new. We need to find out why we exist. And if Jesus said, I will build, then what does it take to build successful church? What does it take to, be, to, to get and stay excited about the church? Let me just tell you that this word, I will build my church. Build means process. Building doesn't happen overnight. How many of you ever built anything? Even birdhouse. Or you build anything like doghouse. I, I actually started building doghouse a long time ago and, and ended up buying one. But whenever you build something, you know there's planning involved. You need to, be, you need to have well thought out plan. How are you going to get there? Jesus is the builder and inventor of the church. And we are the church of Jesus. Even though we may claim to, to be part of any denomination or to be part of any group, we are church of Jesus Christ. He owns us because he paid for us. So he claims ownership to us because he paid full price. He said, whatever it is, I pay for it. And it's mine. So I want to be on his team. I want to cooperate with him. I want to be on his team. I want to be excited about what Jesus is excited. Now, when we say building, how many of you ever start building something and they're like, okay, let's start building a house. Let's start building a house. Well, what kind of house do we want? Uh, we'll see as we go. We start pouring foundation and we're like, okay, maybe bedroom here. No, no, not a good idea. Let's move it here. And then, how, how tall is it going to be? Well, I don't know. But we'll see. Is one story enough? Maybe two stories. Okay. But you know, if you ever built anything, that how tall it's going to be depends what kind of foundation you have. You need to start with foundation. Because if you want to build two story, you need a bigger foundation. If you want three story, even bigger. Some people start church and then they say, Okay, well, I think it should be this way. And another person said, I think it should be this way. Why not this way? So what is it? To have, to, to build successfully, here is what we need. To build anything successfully. We need a design. Design determines what kind of style. Do you like colonial? Do you like traditional? Do you like any other style? Now, style is not the problem, but you need to know what you want to build, right? If you start ultra uh, contemporary style, especially Pacific Northwest, they're known for their ultra contemporary style, everything square, everything just perfectly lined up, you can turn that house into traditional because your frame and everything would look different. When you start something, you need to know the style. Now. You can live in house of any style. You can be part of church of any style. Style is not most important. Make sure everything is done well and right. Style can change. But you need to know what kind of style you want. If you've been coming to our church, this is the style of church we chose. It didn't happen by accident. We chose this style. So if you like it, I want you to enjoy it, to be happy about it. If you don't like it, it's not about to change. <laughs> I'm sorry. But I have plan in mind what kind of people we're trying to reach. That's why style determines who we're trying to reach. So, the style. Then you need to have set of plans, a blueprint. Blueprint will determine your layout. How, do, how does the layout of your house will be? And it's not most crucial, but people like different things. So you need to have a layout. You need order and stages of what is done first, 
and what do you follow it with? So you need to have planned out order and stages of your building process. And when Jesus said, I will build my church, there are priorities in the church. So what do you do first? What do you do next? Then you need people who will do it. You can have your plans. You will have your style. But who will do it? We don't have a team of people somewhere stuck in the back. They just come out in the morning. They do everything. You all know that it's, it's you who are doing the work. So we need people. And I thank you every chance I get. Because I know you don't have to do this. You don't owe me anything. But I know God has touched your life God has touched your heart at some point, and now you can sit still. If you hear something happening at the church, you are here. And it's not because of me. It's because of Jesus. Because he touched your life. He changed your life. And you want to be on his team because he's building. He never stopped building. He's always on, on the move. And I want to be on his team. So I appreciate every one of you for being obedient to God. Let me just tell you why I'm out it. If we did everything we know by now, we'd be way ahead. The problem in today's Christian society is, is not lack of knowledge. It's lack of obedience. If you know something to be true and you know God has called you to do it, you better do it. Do it quick. That's where happiness is. It's not easy, but it's satisfying Maybe it's not easy, but it will bring you blessing. It will bring you purpose in life. It will give you future whenever you say, Jesus, I want to be on your team. So we need people. We need resources. How are we going to pay for it? How are we going to pay for it? Let me tell you, if you go to the bank now, if I go to the bank and I say, bank, I need $100,000. They will say, why do you need this? Well, I need to build whatever I need to build. They say, no, we can't give you. Why? You have no history as a church. You're brand new. You don't have credit. You don't have anything. So we won't lend you any money. We won't give you any money. That's what we'll bank will tell you. But I'm so grateful that everything happened because someone did believe in us. Someone, and those people are here. Those are not strangers. They're not outside of this church. People who became part of this church say, I'm going to invest in it because I believe in it. I'm going to invest in it. Did you know that it took us about 100, more than 100,000 to start this church? And people invested. People gave. So I am so thankful that when God sets to do something, he will find people I haven't heard that money rained in the church ever. <laughs> but I heard that people generously gave. And I'm just, I'm just telling you, there is no better place to invest than in church of Jesus. There is no better place to invest than in his church and what he is doing. It's not perfect. Why? Because we're all here. But it's the best this world has. It's us, his church. Now, I do have personal experience in building, and I have scars on my body to prove it. Maybe someday I'll tell you. I have more than one, more than 10 stitches of building experience. And, you know, building the church, building the house, you might have scars. But looking back, no regrets. Looking back, what you built. Looking back, what's happening here, you may be tired. You maybe even have some scars. But God is glorified. People's lives are changed. We have future. Many lives will be changed for the eternity. Many families, maybe chil many children will be changed for eternity. So I want to be invested in what God is doing. Now, let me just tell you this. <clears throat> maybe your experience in the church was not the best for many reasons in previous churches or even in this church. Whenever I talk to volunteers, I, I always want to tell you that as a pastor, as a, our lead team, we will try to do everything to prevent you from trouble in the church. But I can't guarantee it. Why? Because you're all surrounded by people. And where is people? There is trouble. 
Some will misunderstand someone. Some will be hurt. Some will be offended. But this is all we got. We have each other, and we can do more together than alone. So there is no choice for us. I want us to be together. I want you to be filled with love and compassion when you work along with someone. Because their, their experience in life, their past, whatever they had previously, it shows up whenever there is a new situation. You don't even know sometimes where it's coming from. But they had negative experience. And they see life through their lenses. And maybe you don't mean anything negative, but... Because they've been hurt before, all of a sudden they think you're going to hurt them. They think you're not trusting them because of the, the, their previous experiences. Now, I'm not here to tell you that, sh- that the experience you have isn't real or maybe people w- were not disloyal to you. I'm not here to disprove that. I am here to tell you that the best place worth investing in yourself, your money, your talent is the church of Jesus Christ. The best place in the world. Jesus is all in when it comes to church. Jesus didn't say, okay, apostles, you go, you go. You guys go, start a church. I will see how it goes. If it goes well, you can call yourself Christians. You can say, Jesus is our Lord. No, Jesus said, I will be with you always. No matter what. And we know Christian church did not have blameless history in the world. There are some very dark moments in Christian history. But Jesus said, I will be with you always. I will be with you always. I want to be invested in the things God is invested. Now, being as part of something big starts with doing your small part. You know how people say, I want to be part of something bigger than myself. And they mean fame, they mean money, they mean business. This is the best place to be bigger than yourself. More than 2.2 billion people in this world are going the same direction you are going. You want to be part of something big? Start doing your small part and doing your small part well. Do it well. Let me tell you a little story. When I just came to U.S., it was a long time ago. I was 19 years old. <clears throat> and so I finished school. Uh, and I came here, no English, nothing. So um, here's my first job. I go to, to employment agency and they say, okay, we found you a job. And translator comes with me for interview. And this is a cabinet shop. Cabinet shop, it's a, not a big shop, but it, about 10 people work in there, a little shop. So um, they say, okay, you're hired. You're hired. I fill out an application. They help me. You're fired. You're hired. Not fired yet. (laughs) So I start a job. And you know what a new guy, they like look at you weird. You're like, he doesn't speak English. He doesn't know. So don't tell me about um, people thinking weird about you. Like, you know, something that if you're white, you never experienced any, anything weird. I did experience that. So I know how it feels to be like singled out, to be not understood, not being able to communicate, whatever. So we all experience that to some degree. So here I am. I never held those tools in my hands like the sender and belt sender and nail gun and all that. I never, never held it in my hands. Never. Even though my dad was a carpenter, but he, he, was, he worked as a carpenter before I was born. So, here I am, starting to learn. And you know what kind of job they give me? They give me these jobs like sending drawer fronts or making uh, uh, some kind of parts that I have no idea how they're being used. So, my job was extremely boring. And when you do sending all day long, did you know that you don't feel your hands at night? They just become numb. So I come home and I try to sleep and they're all numb. So I'm holding my hands like this uh, to sleep through the night. So, and then I come back in the morning and there's a belt sander. How many of you know when it's summertime, I got hired in summer and you doing belt sanding, it, it heats extremely. It just overheats and it, it just, you're sweating and there's no AC in the shop. So I was doing that job for a long time. 
not knowing where the parts go. It was extremely boring, can't communicate. And then when it came to using table saw, that was scary. How many of you know that there's a kickback danger when you use table saw? So, and they, I remember they're watching me, like a whole group of guys, they're watching me. And here I'm cutting my first quarter inch plywood. And it's melamine on one side, so it's pretty sleek. You can just, instead of showing me, they're just watching me, just a group of, they knew, they probably knew this is gonna happen. So I didn't raise the blade enough, so I'm pushing it, and it kicks back and hits me in the stomach, and here I'm lying on the floor, and it was bad. So the boss takes me to the, to the hospital because I can't breathe, and they don't know if I have broken ribs. So it was bad, but I got up, I was fine, but you know when it started making sense to me? When they put me on assembly line. Okay, now I take this part. Oh, this is where it goes. Makes sense. And they, they send me out to install. Okay, oh, this, this pantry goes here. And this upper cabinet goes here. And the island goes here. So now it started making sense to me. Now when I'm at the assembly line, I know this is how it's going to look like. It it's makes sense. It became more interesting. And the long story short, I ended up, my brother and I ended up opening a cabinet shop. And my brother still owns that cabinet shop. He celebrated 20 years last year. And every cabinet in my home, I built myself. And we have a cabinet shop now on our property. That's how I started with a job that was boring, I thought it was just the worst job in the world. Once I realized the big picture that there's so much use for woodworking to uh, knowledge and skills that I could do anything. So then I became a builder. I built homes. I built our home that we live in now. So all that information became so useful for my life. But until you know where it fits, all it is, you're just tired. Your hands are tired. And you're just exhausted. You don't know where it leads. So, why do I tell you this? I tell you this to tell you that whatever you're doing at your station, there is a bigger picture. And not until we come to heaven, I think, we're going to understand the full scope of the, of the results, of the consequences of your work. Of my work. So, as I, as I am praying, I'm praying, Lord... Use me as you desire because I don't know what's inside of people's hearts. I don't know what they're going through. I don't know what they're thinking, but you do. You see the bigger picture. Our church is very diverse. How many of you agree that our church is very diverse? And I'm so glad because in heaven, there's going to be people from different nations, different backgrounds, different worldview, different upbringing, and we're all going to be together. We're all going to be together. Just like English unites us in the church, it's language of love. I want to serve you. I want to help you. I want to, I want to do your life better. So I am so excited about our church being diverse because this is how heaven's going to look like. People from all over the world, they're just going to come together. And do you know, there are different theories. I attribute American w victory on, at the Olympics this year to diversity. The most diverse team, Olympic team, was from U.S. Do you agree? Most diverse. And I attribute that to their diversity. There are other, the freedom, freedom of course, freedom and um, uh, opportunities. It's all one thing. But I attribute it to a big degree to diversity. So when we're different, we can do things better together. And I think that's heaven's going to look like. So that inspires me. Our bodies created to work in harmony with all the systems inside of us. Remember I told you there are about 11 major systems within our body? But not only with our own body. We are created to be in harmony with the environment outside of us. So our, our body is just in the harmony with the environment. Growth is a result of health and balance. I want to focus in Connect Church more on health than on growth. 
Because if we are going to be healthy, we will grow. If you're going to be healthy as a Christian, you, wanna, you will grow. That's why we're not going to come after you and say, why don't you do this? Stop doing this. It's time for you to grow. I'm going to try to teach you, pray for you, walk with you. I want you to join Connect Group so you can be in a healthy environment, so you can become healthy, and then you will grow. Our church is growing, and I attribute that to God's grace and blessing on us. But I don't want to focus on growing. I want to focus on health so we are all healthy in Christ, and we are aware that I need health. I need healing constantly because I live in a broken world. Lord, heal me. Restore me. Daily prayer. Lord, I want to grow in you. I want to be stronger in you. Some churches are, grow, uh, are driven by personality, finances, tradition, culture, or even outside influences. Personality-driven churches, they're usually like, Remove one person, and it's done. It, it's not right. Church shouldn't be built on a person. It should be built on idea, on purposes of the church, why we do what we do. Finances, the first question, how much? I don't want us ever to get to that point. It doesn't matter how much. If it needs to be done, God will provide. We will do it if we're investing in something. Tradition, do we need tradition in the church? Yes, there are good traditions, but we're not driven by tradition because tradition could be a major break for the church. It just like always stops at tradition. The question is always is, we never done this way or we have always done this way. That's the sign of traditional church. Outside influence, okay, what is the world saying today? acceptable in the church okay let's do it let's do it so we please everyone that's not right if we please the one who is building the church our job is done if we please him our job is done i don't mind if we offend some people which i'm sure we already have done that but I'm sure as we please God, as we do it from the heart, dedicated to God and to his purposes for the church, we're going to be fine because his blessing would be on this church. Because we're not pursuing our own goals. We're pursuing his heart, his goal, his purposes for the church. His blessing will be upon this church. Now, let me tell you illustration because my time is running out and I have so much more to say. But let me tell you this. Why people see things differently? Why? Um, Well-known church growth expert, experts, <clears throat> they did a survey. They interviewed about 10,000 church members. And they asked them a simple question. Why do you think your church exists? Why do you think your church exists? Now, if I ask you that question, by the way, I am very proud in, in a good way that in Connect Church, if you've been coming for any period of time, you know what our vision is. Some churches, you can go there 100 years and never know what the vision is because it's just simply not there. The biggest vision is to have Sunday morning service. I want you to have vision, share vision of the church that I have for this church. But besides point, beside the point, Then 10,000 church members interviewed, what's the purpose for your church? Did you know that 90% of people, or I'm sorry, 89% of people said to take care of me and my family? <laughs> I thought it was unique. 89% said it's to serve me. I come to church so I can be served. Did you know that when the same researchers ask pastors the same questions, the answer was... I'm sorry, and the 10 and 11 percent said to reach the lost. When they asked the same question of pastors, they said 90 percent said reach the lost, and 10 percent said to serve the people in the church. Do you see how they saw purpose of the church completely reversed? No wonder church doesn't grow. No wonder church is not excited because people come here to be served. And pastor comes and he says, go reach the lost. 
And they come to church, serve me, pray for me, give me, provide for me, be my pastor. Do you see how th there could be disconnect? So how do we find a balance? How do we find a balance? Remember I said, this church is not my church. It's not your church. It's church of Jesus. So what does he have in mind for us? What kind of purposes Jesus has for this church? Now, it's very interesting. Very interesting. The more I study about the church, the more excited I get and more convinced I get that Jesus had this layout way before we realize it's there. So, and churches who took this as a textbook are successful, growing, and thriving. So, all five purposes of the church found in great commandment and in great commission. All five are there. They're there. Let's read this. Matthew 26, 36, 40. Uh, great commandment. Remember teacher, one of the lawyers came in his, and he asked Jesus, Jesus, what is the biggest thing to do? The book of the law is thick. There's so many things. But if I had to do like one thing, what is it? And Jesus said, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God. That's the first purpose of the church, worship. With all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all your mind. And Jesus said, this is first and greatest commandment. Number two, Jesus said, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. If Jesus said, love your neighbor, it would be kind of okay. But he said, love your neighbor as yourself. Whoa, that's, that's different. That's hard. How do I love myself? Love your neighbor just the same way. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So there is two. One, worship. Second, ministry. And then the great commission. When Jesus was about to send his disciples, he said this. Therefore, go and make disciples purpose evangelism. Of all nations, baptizing them, bringing them into fellowship, baptizing, that's fellowship, in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to, that's discipleship. Obey everything I have commanded you. Commanded you. Now, uh, I will pause on that a little later, but this is going. And I, and surely I am with you always. Jesus said, as you do these things, I am with you always to the very end of the age. So, what are the five purposes of the church? Like I said, we're going to be talking about them all throughout before we go into services. Number one, worship. Worship, worship, worship. If we are not excited about God we're worshiping, how are you going to bring new people in? If we're not excited about the one we're worshiping, no one will join the church. So everything starts, Jesus said, love your God. The Bible says, in the Bible, worship means being in love with something or someone with all of your heart. Jesus said, how can you worship money? Whoa, money is not even, uh, uh, not even uh, live objects so how can you worship but jesus said if you love it with all of your heart you're worshiping it so jesus said you can worship two things one so god says love no matter if you're alone or in a group of people when you love god with all of your heart you are worshiping first purpose of the church worship worship god glorify god knowing that everything goes through him number two fellowship baptize them by taking water baptism person says i am one of you do you know why we have those prayer stations in the back i realize for some people it's so hard to come to the front they would much rather go to the back so we don't want to make it more difficult for them we don't make it make it easier but when a time comes to profess i am saved by grace you must do it publicly to take baptism. That's when you're saying, I am part of you. I am taking baptism because I have been saved. So saving, it's a private moment. If you want to have a private fine in public, that's fine. But when you're saying, 
I want to be baptized. It's saying, I have died for myself and I live for Christ. I want to be part of you. Number three, ministry. Love your neighbor as yourself. Anytime you are expressing love to somebody in the name of Jesus, even a cup of cold water given in his name, that's called ministry. It doesn't have to be big. Doesn't have to be huge. Jesus said, even if you give a cup of cold water in my name, that's ministry. And what else I wanted to say about this, when you do something to someone without personal gain in mind, that's called ministry. When you do it with love in Jesus' name. Why people ask, like when we came to, when we went to missions, I tell you, People without Christian mindset, without background, without any exposure to Christianity, they were looking at us. We gave them food, we gave them drink, we gave them clothing, and they're asking, why are you doing this? In their mind, you want something from them. You won't just come from other part of the world and give them stuff. They're, they're trying to figure out why, why, what's, what's behind, what do you want from us? And they're very, very uneasy about taking your stuff. And when we explain them, because we love Jesus, because God has changed us, because he gave us future, we want to bless you. It starts, you know, slowly changing their mind. And, and even then, it takes time for them to realize that someone would care for them without any personal gain in mind. So it's unusual to love someone without any, any, anything in return. But Jesus said, that's ministry, discipleship. Now, for, fourth purpose of the church is discipleship. Teach them to do. I want to emphasize on this. When I talk about discipleship, it's not, Jesus didn't say, go and teach them. Jesus said, go and teach them and baptize. So tell them about me. And then if they believe, baptize them. But then he says, teach them to do. Not teach them to know. He said, teach them to do. That's the whole difference of discipleship. When you know everything, you just person who knows. When you do like your teacher, you are a disciple. That's the difference. You're going to get excited about church when you start doing Whatever Jesus is doing, you're going to start being excited about the church of God, about the future, because you are doing alongside with the master. You're learning from him, and then you're doing. When you just know everything, you are the most difficult person in the world, because you know everything, but you do nothing. Nothing pleases you. So as you learn, start doing. As you learn, start doing, and you're going to be disciple of Jesus. Number five, purpose of the church evangelism. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Go. You must go out there and reach people for Christ. Now, in closing, I just want to dream with you. I want to dream with you. I want you to be excited about what God is doing. But imagine this. Imagine a world where every Christian became a worshiper. Not a Christian in name only, but the worshiper of Jesus. He loved Jesus more than anything in the world. He lived like Jesus was absolute best. Like Jesus was the center of his life. If every Christian was part of fellowship in the church. Now, some of our guys on the team, they wanted to change this word fellowship to hang out. And I said, no, we're going to keep fellowship. It's an old word. But I love about fellowship. That's like we're hanging out, but it's not for purpose hanging out. We want to know, how can I serve you? What is your life like? How do we fit together? What can I do for you to make your life better? That's fellowship. Whenever we serve each other. That's when we, in one body, just like different organs of the body, they make all body to be healthy. So fellowship, imagine a lot of Christians today, they leave church because they see no purpose. And no wonder, I don't judge them. They did not find their purpose in the church because they were just knowing, not doing. They just was learning, not practicing. So it becomes boring. Become disciple of Jesus. 
if every Christian was ministering and became a disciple and evangelized the world around him. 2.2 billion of Christians witnessed and one person brought another person to Christ. Our world would be changed. We can dream about the world, but how about our community? We getting ready to launch the second service. And I'm praying. I want you to, to, to help me and make this your daily prayer. God, as we prepare the place, as we open our hearts, bring the people you want to save in this community. But I want us to be the hands and feet. If they met you and you had Connect shirt on, would they want to come to this church? If they met me and they, would they want to come to this church? Would I treat them well enough? So when I invited them, they would say, oh, I want to go where you go. I want to see what's happening there. Because your life is such a beacon of light. You're different. You, you, you bring something that brings joy. When you come around, there is life. How about changing our community one person at a time? Imagine if every church became a place where broken are made whole, rejected are accepted and loved. Imagine if all Christian demonstrated a denomination, if all Christian denominations, they put aside their differences and they agreed on one thing. Let's demonstrate Jesus to the world. Let's demonstrate not how much we know, but how much we love this world. How much we love people in this world. That would make a difference. Now, let me challenge you today. Will you and you and you commit to become that Christian? I want to be that Christian. Who are committed to all five purposes of the church. And like I told you before, I have a plan that as we go into services and time goes on, we're going to talk about membership. We're going to talk about classes. How you can... You can self-diagnose. Where are you on this, on this scale? Where do you want to go next? What do you want to learn? We're going to have classes for you to learn. If you want to grow in Christ, I want us to grow. I want us to be church, not just revolving church. People come in, they save, they leave. Come in, save, get baptized, they leave. People who come and grow, save others, bring them in. And grow in Christ, help them to grow, help them to join a connect group, help them to become disciples. That's very, very important. So this morning, I want to challenge every one of you to search your heart and say, Lord, how am I excited about your most precious thing in this world, your church? Lord, I want to be excited. I want to, I want to have the insight into things that you see, how you see things, how you change things. Lord, I want to have an insight into your heart. Lord, how excited are you when new person comes? How excited are you when some, someone's life is changed? Lord, how excited are you? I want to be as excited. I want to be as excited. I want to be as committed. Why don't you all just close your eyes and bow your heads. Let's pray. I want you to pray a prayer of faith. I want you to say, Lord, here I am just the way I am, Lord. I know I need to grow. All of us need to grow. But it shouldn't stop you from serving. It shouldn't stop you from being committed all 100%. The best place you can invest yourself is church of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we worship you this morning. Lord, it never ceased to amaze me how much you loved us, that you just gave your life for us without reservations, without limit. You just open your arms on the cross and you says, this is how much I love you. I can't imagine my life without you, Lord. Today I want to confess, Lord, I don't imagine my life without you. I don't imagine my life or my future without you, Lord. And I want to be all in just like you are in the things that you trusted me with, all the talents and gifts, all the opportunities to minister to your church, Lord. I want to be committed all 100%. And I thank you so much for every volunteer. I thank you so much, so much for every ministry leader, for every person who committed their time, talent, resources. Thank you, Lord. 
Spirit of the living God. I pray that you just pour out your fresh anointing on this church, Lord. We're here ready to launch the second service, Lord. We rely on your power, on your provision, and your mighty presence, Lord, to change our lives, to restore our strength, to renew our strength in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray that you will renew every heart and let us see how excited you are when new churches grow, when communities are changed, when futures are changed because of one committed person. Lord, we thank you, Lord. We worship you right now. If you want to be renewed in your commitment, I want you to raise your hand right now. We want to pray for every person who wants to renew their commitment to church, to things of God. So right now, just raise your hand and we'll pray for you. Lord, we pray for those people who just, who just wants to be renewed in their commitment to church and their commitment to things that you value so much. Father, I pray for your, for your renewal in people's hearts and people's lives. Lord, whatever they're carrying right now, Lord, I pray that you just help them to carry the burden, Lord. Help them to see the bigger picture. The life is not easy, but it's so worth it if we're doing it for you. Lord, I pray for encouragement, for power and anointing of the Holy Spirit to renew every heart, every life. In the name of Jesus, you be glorified, Lord. We worship you. We worship you, Lord. We exalt your name. In the name of Jesus, amen.